Dan, thanks so much for taking the time today. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Listen, maybe we can uh, kick off today's conversation by you telling folks a little bit more about your background and how you got into this space of research. Uh, certainly. Um, I guess I got into it the the same route as most with a, with a standard undergrad in, in sport and exercise science back in 2009. Um, and at that time, I thought I wanted to work in, in, in education as a, as a college lecturer. So in, in 2010, I went and did a postgrad sort of in, in education to go down that route. Um, did that for a couple of years, um, realized, do I want to do this until I'm 65? And I thought may, maybe not, uh, in fresh, professional sport, uh, I doing some voluntary work in there. Um, so I nipped back, um, to do the, the masters in sport and exercise nutrition, uh, sort of part-time along, alongside working full-time in education from 2013 to 15. Um, and it was in 2015, I got the big opportunity then to go to John Moore's university in Liverpool, um, so I uh, yeah, sort of quit the full-time um, employment and became a full-time student again, um, doing the PhD there. Really lucky um, with the supervisory team, uh, Dr. Rebecca Murphy and uh, professors Graham Close and James Morton, which was which was great. And in 2019, um, at the back end, off the back of the PhD, started a postdoc. So I'm I'm still there, um, doing that stuff. And and from the work side of things. Um, started off as voluntary work um, whilst I was still teaching and um, working in a professional rugby academy um, with like the under 15s and under 16s kids and that led to, led to a bit of paid work and it was really in 2014 that my first breakthrough came through I guess working with professional jockeys um, and then from 2015 at John Moore's with the with the links and the connections there um, I had a couple of years in professional rugby um, with the Woodness Vikings in in the British Super League um, and then yet today, I've still got the jockey work going on alongside some work in football and, and Formula One. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, the work you're doing at the moment in the weight making space, as you mentioned, in relation to, to jockeys and professional horse racing. You know, I was surprised to read that professional horse racing is actually the second most attended sport in the UK after football, which is pretty impressive. Um, and of course, you know, like a lot of weight making sports and sports in general, obviously, we can take a lot from from what you're finding out in the jockeys and, and transfer that to other sports. But when we look at weight making sports in general, there are a lot of old school weight making strategies that are still used today. Can you talk about some of the ones that professional jockeys might still be using? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, where do we start? This, 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 <laughs> um, I guess I'd describe it. It's a, it's a little bit of a continuum. So at, at one end, um, they're trying to do it through um, calorie restriction and it's probably too much of, of a good thing almost um really it goes from calorie restriction to to pure starvation i guess and sometimes uh, these guys won't eat let, let anything fluid or um fluid or solid past the lips for you know 24 48 hours if they having to really make a make a tough weight mm -hmm. and they usually compound that with some form of sweating some some passive i.e running in a sweatsuit um and then quite a lot uh, so just like passive sweating so active sweating and then and now the passive sweating um and that can really start on a timeline from when they wake up in the morning and they can jump in in like a red hot bath and sit in there for an hour quite often i've learned they they rub the body in in like in table salt and then they'll jump back in i think try to get some sort of osmosis going and and then sweat as much as they can out um, and then through the morning whilst they're, they're riding the horses sort of like exercising them um they'll get sort of rubbed up themselves multiple layers even even in the height of summer um, and then during the early afternoon when they're driving to the races, um, because jockeys tend to, there's no team bus, they'll drive themselves there. Uh, again, they'll, they'll wear the sweatsuit and they'll have the heated seat on and the, and the heaters on full whack in the car, try to sweat wow. as much as they can. And, and then when they get there, if, if they still need to lose some weight, they'll, they'll gladly jump in the sauna and they'll spend an hour or two in and out of the sauna getting reweighed. Um, so it can be, it can be pretty relentless, um, I mean, the, at the other end of the continuum, where it's a little bit more more risky and a bit more dangerous. That although the band, there are probably still some um, misguided use of, of diuretics and laxatives. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the the real nastiest thing, I guess, is that self-induced vomiting, um, which not all jockeys do. It's it's a it's a minority thing, but it's uh, it's still something that that goes on. And yeah, it's not it's not a great practice, but unfortunately, it's still a uh, a means that some jockeys still use 
Yeah, it is incredible to see the lengths at which even today in, in sport and professional racing that jockeys will go to. And you see it, of course, across other sports as well. And I think the thing that really jumped out at me was the fact that, you know, unlike, let's say, mixed martial arts or boxing, you know, these jockeys are weighing in almost every day, right? Um, which obviously has some pretty significant potential health implications. So could you walk listeners through some of the potential pitfalls of, of those types of strategies for making weight? And of course, the fact that they have to make that weight so frequently. Yeah, I mean, in in the UK, uh, racing takes place on 362 days of the year. Um, so for flat jockeys, that really is 362 days of the year because through the through the summer months when we race on the turf, that's on the grass. But then in the winter months, um, since the early 2000s, we've all then, we've, we've then got um, dirt racing as well, which flat jockeys will then transition from the summer months right the way through the winter months. So it's for those guys, it, it, it is tough because they're doing Incredible. it all, all year round. Um, and unlike in other sports, that not a lot of them are, are mega wealthy, so they, so they struggle to find um yeah well the struggle to take time off just financially um so they will sort of put themselves through it and i guess in terms of the health side of things i guess you can break it down in, into two parts is the there's the acute effects of of making weight on the day and doing that day in day out and then the potential you know long-term chronic implications of, of doing this over of the duration of a career um i guess the the acute ones um the more around the, I guess the increased risk of injury, the, the, the things that come with low muscle glycogen, um, massive dehydration. So I guess lapses in concentration, um, decreased um, sense of awareness, balance coordination. I've spoken to many jockeys that have, have fallen off uh, during a race and uh, they don't remember falling off, they basically fainted sort of on the horse. Um, so I guess the, the biggest risk on the day is probably the risk of, of, of falling off. Um, it's a pretty good risk as well, isn't it? Yeah, and and the, the the biggest thing that you probably see with jockeys on a day to day basis who are going through the ringer, chasing chasing the weight is is the mood. Um, they can be very erratic on on race day and uh, and quite short tempered, partly because they the may not have eaten all day or all week, um, and the dehydrate, the thirsty. Um, so yeah, the, the, the mood is a big one and maybe the long-term effects of, of that, there's no evidence to suggest what it might be, but I'm, I'm not sure if there's something, something there. Um, in terms of long-term effects on health generally, um, I guess you can never, you, you can't be certain what the future holds because there's, there's no actual evidence on this, um, group of jockeys and what's the effect of, of the rate of weight cycling day in day out over you know over, over five ten fifteen years um one study from a group in ireland um they had a look at some um some retired jockeys um i think they were around 60 years old and they've been retired like 20 odd years um, and there was no real other than two-thirds of them were sort of overweight and there was no real um nothing really to write home about there was no um prevalence of disease or anything like that but it's really hard to to, to correlate between um, being a jockey and, and anything that you could see there anyway and what we really need is some longitudinal data so try and get these guys early and if we can track them through the um through the entirety of the careers if we can and even into retirement that'd be that'd be great um i guess if you want to have a guess at something i mean we know that these guys are potentially um low energy athletes low energy availability mm -hmm. and then is the is the their prevalence of reds now and maybe then the the lasting consequence of that um in terms of long-term effect of suppressed immune function does that open them up to diseases maybe um you know, decreased bone health um and then does does some of this um, disordered eating which we see does is there the risk of that tipping over actually into eating disorders and i mean anecdotally i can say i've seen it a couple of times but probably not in the masses yeah it's interesting isn't it because even in sport just like in life environment is such a powerful influencer and in your earlier work you note that you know approximately 63 percent of jockeys actually prefer to seek weight making and nutrition advice from their peers and retired elders rather than qualified nutritionists dietitians um 
you know, can you comment on that? And, and, you know, as you do your research now and today, are we still in that space or are things improving? Um, a little bit of both, I guess. Um, it's a very, very insular sport. And even even now, young jockeys will um, probably take the advice of, of elder jockeys and senior jockeys and just people who have been around the industry a lot longer over, over that of, of professionals. I mean, I'm looking now in the sense that I've been around the sport for, for seven years. So I'm... Um, Within within horse racing, at least, I'm I'm well known. Um, so jockeys tend to come straight to me, and and the 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 guys at John Moores University, um, and within the Professional Jockeys Association nutrition team, we've been around a while, so we're trusted. Um, but when I first came into like I, I I played rugby up until being 23. So when I first started working with with jockeys, I was like <laughs> I was like, like who is this guy? Yeah, he's way I, too big. And some of these guys are like 50 kilos, 52 kilos. So I'm literally twice the weight of some of them, and I'm, and I'm telling them how to how to be a light, um, so I can appreciate the skepticism at the time. But thankfully, I've been around a while, um, so they are. Well, I think they're taking what I'm saying on board a little bit more than they used to, anyway. Um, but yeah, it is. It's still an insular sport, and um, for sure, um, the word within the dressing room. Um, is still king, I, I say, I'd guess, um, over that of experts, generally speaking. Yeah, and you also talk about how jockeys don't have this athlete identity. You, know, you mentioned, you know, coming from rugby and obviously sports like rugby, American football, basketball, you know, soccer, obviously what the rest of the world calls football. These are sports that athleticism is really um, top of the table. And of course, you know, you write about how you know, these jockeys don't have an athlete identity. They have a jockey identity. Can you unpack that a little bit for listeners? Certainly, yeah. Um, I guess it's easier to a little bit to go back to how I sort of stumbled upon that. Um, when I first started doing the doing the research, one of the key, the burning question was, like, why, despite all the, the research that had been done over the last five years by Graham and James and the team at the university, all the evidence of... Um, how to make weight safely and the the detrimental effects on health and performance of of acute and you know continuous sort of rapid weight loss. Were jockeys still doing it despite all the evidence sort of suggesting that you shouldn't? Um, so I interviewed a bunch of people within the industry, so jockeys themselves, their agents, their trainers, some jockey coaches, um, basically to asking questions around like why is that still the case? And one of the key things that came through was right across the industry there's a lack of perception that these guys are professional athletes and when you talk to the jockeys themselves they're sort of split down the middle really as to whether they self-identify as a professional athlete or not and when you try to drill down a little bit further and say well why is that when you i, I try to compare them to um, boxers or mixed martial artists mm -hmm. or lightweight rowers and one of the things I alluded to early, earlier is um, maybe the, the monetary reward that you get for it. Um, so when they look at um, people like Floyd Mayweather or um, Conor McGregor, who are multi-multi-millionaires, uh, jockeys only get around £100 per race. So the average salary of, of jockeys is actually only around £30,000 per year, which is compared oh. to that of like a police officer or a, or a nurse for example um there are some at the elite end who are multimillionaires, but most of their money comes through um endorsements and advertisements and the bigger prize money in the in the in the top top races mm -hmm. 600 around 600 professional jockeys in the uk um, and the vast majority of them aren't sponsored and aren't uh, endorsed by by um, big companies so they're picking up just general salaries and i think that's that's one key as to why they don't identify as athletes um there's this sense to an extent with some of your older school um, practitioners generally within the industry that they're treated a little bit like commodities um rather than um, they're not wrapped up in cotton wool like we might see some of the soccer players mm -hmm. uh, so, so they're not treated like athletes from people within the industry which in some ways is good, it keeps them humble um, but at the same time I think it has a bit of a negative adverse effect in that they don't necessarily look after themselves um, because they're not um, yeah, I, they're not seen as athletes by other people and I think that has a, um, an effect on how they see themselves 
Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, that mindset piece is, is so so massive in terms of behaviors. And of course, we're going to talk about behaviors mm-hmm. a little further down the road here. Now, if we circle back to the discussion around relative energy deficiency, and of course, things like bone density and fractures, which, you know, in jockeys is something that uh, is a concern. And of course, you've done some work in this area on whether, you know, reds or potentially other stimuli are potentially leading to this increased risk. Can you share a little bit of your work and then and describe to the listeners some of the key findings? Uh, sure. So I guess it's been a vogue area of, of research over the last few years, really, since since REDS became a thing in, I think it was around like 2014, um, after like an upgraded it, if you like, form just the female athlete triad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but over the last, I'd say, two or three years, um, the guys at, at John Moore's University, we've we've been questioning whether Reds exists within within jockeys. Um, so a piece of work that we did, we wanted to theoretically or if you could hypothesize, we think jockeys who have been in the game for 15, 20, 25 years should, in theory, um, have worse health than the guys that are just coming in. Take bone health, for example. Uh, we might have some 16 or 17-year-old um, rookie apprentice jockeys coming in theoretically their bones should be um, should be healthy and if these guys have been hammering themselves with no food and a lot of dehydration and low energy availability and um, sh- we, we should in theory see a correlation and, and a decline in bone health as, as you get older and you stay in the game absolutely uh, but we found that there's absolutely no no difference, and, and we were quite surprised uh, to find that the the bone health and the bone status of um, some of the teenagers um, was as bad, if not worse, as some of the jockeys that have been around in the game for like 15 or 20 years. Wow. So that brings into the question: Does does Reds exist um, in jockeys at least? And I mean that's just one piece of evidence, I guess. But when you a uh, couple of that with with some of the other findings from from his other bits of research um you can perhaps build a case that they don't i mean working with jockeys um in terms of body comp even though these guys are light i mean some of them are like 110 pounds if you get them to take the top off they're not they're not ripped you'd, you'd expect them to be you know visible abs and and nothing on them just skin and bone really and that's not always the case um they're carrying still quite a bit of of, of fat tissue um, and probably too much when you consider that they, some of these guys are sweating four or five pounds off every single day to make a weight but then you you stick them on the DEXA scanner and they've got like 15 pounds of of excess um, fat tissue so we're not just talking 15 pounds total we're talking like 15 pounds in excess um, wow so, yeah, that's interesting absolutely and that'll only happen through I guess there the can't be in chronic energy deficiency all the time and, and still have that much fat fat mass on them. Um, and when you look at bone, some of, sorry, um, some of the blood work, we've looked at bone turnover, so like CTX and NTX, um, there and, and like PTH, mm-hmm. the, the scores are normal. They're within normative ranges. So again, if if the bones were, were wasting away through low energy availability, we're expecting would expect to see these markers of um, bone resorption sort of high or elevated at least, but they're not. They're within within, they're within normal ranges. Um, and, and and I think the, the, the kicker is, I think the reason um, why we see poor bone health but not necessarily impaired um, turnover is it's just a lack of osteogenic stimulus. And a lot of these guys are plonked on a horse at a young age because it's like a family thing or it's something they've always wanted to do. And that's their sport of choice from being maybe eight or nine years old. Um, then all of a sudden, your sports like hockey and soccer and rugby sort of go out the window. The the sports where you're accelerating, decelerating, change of direction, you're in the gym. Um, they're not getting that load uh, through the skeleton. And instead, they're sat on a horse and the horse takes the, the impact through the floor. And as a result, um, yeah, you just, there's just a lack of development in, in, yeah, in skeletal tissue, we think. Yeah, it was really interesting to see, you know, the, the RMRs matching up from the predicted versus what you guys measured in the lab. And, of course, one of the individuals as well that you noted, a, a former amateur boxer who, who sort of stood out from the rest of the group because, just as you mentioned, they had obviously done a lot of training and a more load-bearing exercise. And so, that you know, that was one of the individuals that actually had decent bone density. So it, it is a pretty interesting 
aspect of this. And of course, you know, if we talk, you know, here we're talking jockeys, but this could extend again to other weight making sports. And of course, when we talk behaviors, it could extend to the whole whole population, really. And of course, behaviors are so fundamental to the decisions we make every day as humans. And of course, nutrition is a big one because most people are eating at least three times a day. You know, can you share with us a little bit of the, you know, your most recent work here around behavior change and, and some of the you know, Susan Mishi's work and the model that you use and adapting that to, to professional jockeys. Uh, certainly. Yeah. Um, the reason we sort of got into the behavior change, uh, world and taking an interest in behavior change science was, um, after those initial interviews with, uh, with the other stakeholders, it, it sort of became clear that there's a, there's a huge disconnect or disparity between knowledge and behavior. And when you speak to jockeys, and you ask them around the knowledge quite often the know they can recite pretty much the the guidelines that we're we're advocating and we're pushing um but they're just not doing them um so it's we think knowledge isn't necessarily the the problem it's it's behavior um and when i first looked into behavior change science um i was terrified by the amount well the number of theories and um, that you could sort of get involved in for sure uh, but yeah, the the work from like Susan Mishi and and the guys at um, yeah at UCL, the University of College London, and the and the behaviour change uh, department there, they've developed a theory called the the Com B model, which ultimately means if someone wants to engage, or if you want someone to engage in a behaviour, in in our case, sort of eating well and and making weight safely, uh, there's three elements that you need to satisfy. The first is are they capable. Um, of performing uh, that behavior and by capable we mean do they have the required knowledge of what to do and how to do it and then the skills element so can they actually go to the supermarket and and shop and then and then cook that properly um, and I think we do that quite well we educate jockeys really well from when they're licensing um, and there's a lot of supplementary materials sort of online and, and through through the support networks in the UK and that's, I think that's where it's always it's ended there. Uh, the combi model, the, the O stands for opportunity. So these guys need the opportunity to engage in that behavior. Um, and opportunity can broken down into two bits. There's the physical environments that we're in. And if I were to ring a jockey up at any time of day, 24 hours, I can guarantee they'll either be in one or four places, they'll either be at home, They'll be on the yard where the horses are, like sort of exercising them. They'll be in the car. They usually spend about six or seven hours a day driving, or they'll be at the races. Um, so those four locations, if they're not geared up to facilitate and they're not conducive to the needs of a jockey nutritionally, and quite often they're not, um, then it's tough for them to engage in the behavior. And then it's the social environment. So who's in those environments? So if you've got old school jockeys or old school practitioners at the yard advocating or just jumping the bath, jumping the sauna, you know, forget the diet, um, that that's that's a barrier as well. It's tough to push be. back, right? Absolutely. Um, and it was really interesting. A couple, I think last week I was listening to uh, one of your previous episodes with uh, Krista Scott Dixon from Precision Nutrition, and she went on a lot about. Um, about behaviors and and the uh, yeah, environments and environment manipulation to to get guys to um, improve dietary behavior and I was nodding along the entire time. Um, and the final part of the combi model is is motivation. So if, assuming they've got the knowledge and the skills and assuming the the environments that they're in are set up, some people still don't do it and it comes down to to motive and they need. Um, yeah, they need to want to do it. And there's two types of, of motivation. There's um, reflective motivation, which is aligns them aligns with their beliefs. And so if we can get them young and educate them and convince them this is the way that you should do it and not the, not the old school way, um, and hopefully they've got a good professional attitude, they'll be more likely to want to do the right thing consistently. But then there's controlling the impulse. Um, so there's controlling the chimp. If you had a bad day and you've got a bad result, the easiest thing to do is on the drive home is to stop off you know pick up a few beers get a you know, get some cake you know whatever it is that makes you makes you feel good um and it's about them having the self-control i guess to to not cave in and um and yeah i guess pass those those mental tests 
yeah, it's incredible how you know people do need to be capable. They need to have the opportunity and they need to have that motivation to be able to accomplish a task. And you know, as you guys implemented this um, into your research in amongst the professional jockeys, can you describe to listeners how intakes you know changed or, or sometimes didn't change over the course of the uh, intervention? Yeah, I mean, we're really ambitious. We want to tour, um, take on the take on the industry, really. And so we needed to be mindful that one person or one small team couldn't do it alone. Um, so we actually recruited the the help of a lot of the stakeholders um, that I did the very initial interviews with, plus other people, and asked them really how how if we're going to do this and it's going to be a joined up approach across the industry, how do we do it? Um, uh, so we we tackled the the curriculum in the in the licensing school, so where jockeys go to get the license and 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 change some of the uh, the, the curriculum, and then just the day to day being there. So typically it was just three or four lessons and riding horses twice a day. And whereas it's like we've got them right at the beginning of the career. Let's change their day so and let's let make them live. 24 7 how ideally they should live as a perfect professional athlete with regards to exercise and nutrition um, and then once they got licensed and within the early part of the career so the first two months of the careers um, they received um, like additional support through social media and they got to visit the labs at John Moore's University um, so yeah it was implementing um, so giving them the correct knowledge if you like so developing that capability from the very start I say giving them the opportunity, but it was almost like forcing the opportunity upon them during that um, early period of the career um, to do the right things properly, build those habits. And if you can do them for a couple of weeks, they're more likely to then run with them um, autonomously in their careers. Um, and then by bringing, I guess, motivating people in, um, so role models, senior role models, ex, ex-jockeys who've been there and done it and, and sort of killed it in a good way, um, got them to deliver the messages that typically I'd deliver um get them to deliver it instead um yeah we saw some good results so over over like the 12 week intervention um knowledge went up so the cool thing is that we did it with two groups so we had one group of professional jockeys who were licensing and um, we use as the intervention group uh, versus an, another group of licensing jockeys that we use as the control group and the intervention group who received um, the new education, if you like, and the behavior change intervention, uh, their knowledge over the 12 weeks improved threefold, um, which is a good thing. Phenomenal, yeah. Uh, but as I said earlier, well, like knowledge doesn't necessarily mean anything with, with in terms of behavior. Without application, yeah. But we but we did see uh, marked improvements in there, like carbohydrate and and protein um, habits that aligned. Um, directly with with what the research is saying so protein intakes around two to two and a half grams per kilo uh, carbohydrates pretty low around you know somewhere between two and four grams per kilo and, and fat was still slightly elevated but it had decreased um compared to that of the the control group um everything had improved as well there because they'd received obviously some education um but it wasn't really significant um so yeah so just from that um small um, scale pilot study, if you like, but in the real world setting, um, we saw some good success. And and thanks to the industry, have taken a lot of those um, recommendations and and kept them going. That's fantastic, and it is really interesting, isn't it, when athletes get information from from one of their own, so to speak, where an athlete and a retired athlete, or you know, one of the elite athletes who's effectively saying all the same things you've been saying for the last how many years. Um, but there's that extra little bit of, of modeling and, and and just buy-in from the athletes, isn't it, to be able to then really take on board some of these things. And I'm, I'm really curious about the use of social media, obviously, because, you know, for us at Canada Basketball, obviously our young athletes live on social media. I mean, even answering emails is, is tough. It's more like if you want to get a hold of somebody these days, it's, uh, you know, WhatsApp or, or DMs, right? So, you know, with respect to using some of these social media platforms for behavior change, for education, for interaction with athletes, can you talk a bit about um, you know, the interactions with the jockeys and, and what we're seeing maybe in the performance nutrition space as a whole? For sure, yeah. Um, I'll I'll just quickly pick up on the on the touch about role models. Um, one thing that I, I did quite a bit of reading around 
um, around who are the best models to use um, ahead of getting the people in. And although you could go for the superstars, so if we were talking about soccer, it'd be amazing to get someone like Cristiano Ronaldo in or Messi. Mm -hmm. But what you find is that the distance between where these guys are at the very beginning of the career and where the superstars are, sometimes the... The gap's too big, right? The gap's too big. So quite often, if you can get a role model who's maybe only three or four years into their career, um, but they've lit it, lit, it, lit it up, they can see the... They can almost like see the journey. Um, so sometimes you get more out of those uh, young role models than you do out of the, of the, out of the superstars. Great insight. But uh, yeah, with regards to the social media... I mean, because this was just a pilot study, most of it was done um, exactly like you mentioned there, like via via WhatsApp. Um, so we targeted the the jockeys for ten weeks post um, post licensing, so in so the first ten weeks of their careers, and just hit them with like push messages. Um, we wanted to see would this you know would would this information work, and would was there any any interaction um, back off it? So they weren't obliged to reply, but if they wanted to reply, they could. Um, and if they did, then I was basically a, a nutrition coach on the other end of that conversation. Um, and and it was surprising, actually, how many of them were interested if you push the message out. Um, so I think the key now is in something we're working towards in the industry um, is using like a centralized app um, where the yeah, general generic content will get pushed out. And it doesn't have to be limited to nutrition. Now we know this works to an extent. You can push out some of the strength and conditioning stuff on there. Um, yeah, exercise related to getting some osteogenic stimulus, thing, things like that. Um, but to be honest, um, we're probably behind in horse racing, we're probably behind the curve. And we've got a lot to learn probably from from the sports, you know, probably the team sports space, uh, see how, how they're doing it well and, and try and drag that across. Yeah, it was interesting to see, you know, 90% of people aged 16 to 34 are active on social media, obviously. So this this medium of being able to connect with people, and it's just as you mentioned, being able to drip feed some of this information in. And we don't even know if, if people are necessarily going to engage, but it kind of opens the door for them to engage. And oftentimes... They do, and, and of course, someone like yourself is on the other end to provide the expert advice. And you know, as you mentioned in your work, you know, I guess it's about eighty-nine percent of practitioners now working in elite sport, Olympic sport, are using you know social media as, as a big part of their practice and believe it's beneficial, which is tremendous. But I guess maybe if we flip to the other side of the coin here, around the general population, or maybe maybe just younger athletes in this context a lot of them are getting their information off of social media as well. And this information is, is, you know, they're trusting in what they're seeing on Instagram and influencers, et cetera. Can you speak to perhaps that other side of the coin and, and how things can potentially go down the wrong path for some individuals? Absolutely. Um, so historically, as we mentioned, jockeys listen to jockeys, but jockeys of all didn't have social media to, to turn to. So the amount of times now I'm, having to re-educate young jockeys from what they've seen on on social media and with the scourge of of influencers pushing like weight loss weight loss products things like you know weight loss coffee and 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 things like this um you've yeah you spend half your time convincing them that what they're seeing on the internet's not not true and so in terms of the social media space i think there's as not only is it effective in what we're trying to push, but I think there's a requirement for us to have it so we can see what these guys are also exposed to and to negate the effect of some of the, I guess, the negative push messages that you're getting from yeah, influencers on, on Instagram and things like that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough one because um, the amount of times now um, I go into the, into the weighing room, into the dressing room, and I might get asked, um, about certain products and it's, it's getting out of control where I haven't I haven't even heard of them it's my job to have heard of them and I, and I haven't heard of them and so I'm thinking all right give give me five minutes and I'll jump online and 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 read Have it up look. and and yeah 99 times out of 100 it's um yeah it's nonsense it's um sort of like snake oil and uh, if anything um just a massive anti-doping risk um and sometimes that's the best way. I mean, when we're talking about behavior change, sometimes yeah, education is a great thing. Sometimes plain coercion is a, is a, is a tool that you can use. Um, and if you can scare some of the guys off and saying, look, you take that, you're at a huge risk of an anti-doping violation. And if you want to be sat on the, 
on the sidelines twiddling your thumbs for the next six months you know so like go ahead um and some jockeys respond to that better than the actually listen to me this is good for you and i'd rather you do this instead some of them just respond to the to the negative advice um and so sometimes that's the right approach to take as well absolutely yeah, i totally agree with that and you know on this topic dan i mean obviously with this idea of people getting misinformation maybe you're just starting to work with a certain athlete client individual and obviously let's say the information they've gotten from instagram or wherever is is again bad information but you've just started working with them how do you kind of bridge that gap when they start asking these questions is this good is this good and of course the answer as you mentioned 99 percent of the time is no um but from just a connectivity standpoint and trust and all these types of things and building that with with a new client it's it's such a fine line to tread isn't it to be able to try to the responses that we give and the way that we answer those questions i was curious of any strategies that you have or how you sort of handle those situations yeah, no, good question. I think it depends on what the product is. Um, when you were saying that, something that popped into my head um, was when, obviously, when Game Changers came out um, late last year. Mm-hmm. I, this is away from racing as well, but it's even within the racing community. I was getting asked questions all the time about, you know, should we go vegan? Should we be eating meat? And the approach I tend to took was, well, what do you think about the? What did you think about it? You know, you've watched it. What did you think? Um and and I'd sort of agree with them to an extent, saying, you know what, I'm I watched it. I thought it was a great. I thought it was a great documentary. Really, really interesting. Um, what did you take away from it? And try to pick, um, I guess, try to pick out like what were their key take home messages that they got, and then go from there. Um, never to go with the approach that's saying ignore that that's wrong you're wrong for thinking that mm-hmm. um so let's engage them in a meaningful conversation figure out what they're thinking what their thoughts are on it um agree with them to some extent um but then bring the conversation around so well, we thought about this and thought about that and actually did you know that you know the, the um the director is a movie director so it's going to be it was fantastically made you know the guys made hollywood movies and oh by the way he you know, he owns, uh, oh, he's got massive shares in a you know, plant-based company and, and then and bring the conversation around and try to get a bit of a discussion going. Um, and I mean, hopefully, like I say, I'm lucky within horse racing anyway, because I'm reasonably well trusted now, um, but maybe that's not always the case in, in new ventures. Um, but that's the approach I've, I've tended to take is not just shut the door on something, try to engage conversation. Um, and I think if go with a the humanistic approach the person first approach and i think if you can build a good relationship um then the the, the trust will come naturally um off the back of that that's yeah great suggestion i mean that's just always tremendous to be sort of turning it back on them to really try to understand what it is that they took out of this piece of information um, rather than unfortunately we still see this a lot in you know whether it's medical practice or dietetics or training or whatever else that people you know, practitioners might just immediately give the no answer. And then, you know, that, that relationship is obviously compromised right from the outset. And Dan, if we, if we shift gears a little bit, I mean, your work here in weight making jockeys, obviously tremendous. You talked about some of the work you're doing in, in formula one. Can you share some of the things that are crossing over or some of the problems, you know, similarities or differences that you're seeing in professional uh, formula one racing? Yeah, I guess it's really surprising how many parallels there are between horse racing and and, and Formula One. Um, the the fact that the the horse is the car, if you like, and the jockey is the <laughs> and so true. Then, yeah, and then and then the workforce behind it. So within horse racing, you've got dozens and dozens of people caring for the horses, looking after them, riding them in the morning. Um, and then each race team within Formula One's got a team of, I mean, I remember like around fifty or sixty. Um, mechanics and engineers looking after the car every day um, you know tweaking it looking after it making adjustments and changes and um, so from a team dynamic point of view there's a heck of a lot of of, um, of, of similarities um, the difference is I guess um, F1 is um, a lot more um, further on in terms of the mindset around them being athletes um, there's no question about that. If you were to ask any driver, you're an athlete. That's uh, absolutely. Um, but then the people underneath that, in terms of the mechanics and the, and the race team, um, if you were to ask them, are they athletes? Which I guess they're not. Um, they'd 
say no we're me- you know we're mechanics and some of them look after themselves and some of them really really don't um and you get a you get a lot of that with the workforce in in horse racing as well they'll say well no we're not the jockeys we're the race force uh, so we're, we're the workforce um, and as such, their lifestyle, behaviours and attitudes aren't, aren't always great, even though they've got incredibly manual jobs and they need to be on it every day of the year. Um, yeah, they're, they're not. So there's actually quite a lot of a lot of similarities. And in terms of differences, I'm, I'm still learning that. So I've only been with, with the F1 team since, um, since January. So I'm only like 10 weeks into the role. So I'm still learning it very much myself. Um, but without question, the um, experiences uh, I've had for the last seven years in racing uh, standing me in good stead um, for working with the F1 team. A hundred percent. And, you know, maybe if we round things off here by talking a bit of specifics around hydration and more specifically dehydration, mm-hmm. when we look at professional jockeys and horse racing, whether we look at Formula One drivers, obviously dehydration has big impacts on the on the cognitive side could you speak to some of the potential risks there for for one or both individuals and and some of the ways to to mitigate those risks certainly yeah i mean within within racing we did a a, a cool study in fact i I say we i can't take credit for it It was it was prior to my time at john moore's but um they got a group of, of 12 jockeys to come along and do a battery fitness test and then come back a week later um and Prior to doing, well, repeating the test, they got them to stick a sweatsuit on and, and run for 45 minutes um, to sweat a couple of pounds out. And uh, even just two pounds, which jockeys are really accustomed to doing, um, they witnessed there like a 14% decrease in upper body strength, um, 5% decrease in, in leg strength. Um, and then like a decrease in the a horse race, almost like a wing gate test in the last 30 seconds, you really, really hammer it and decrease sort of like pushing frequency and, and output in, in that last 30 seconds there. Um, and reaction times um, were down by around seven or 8%. Wow. Um, and that's just on a horse. So, I mean, as far as I'm aware, there's no research done in Formula One, or there's, there's like internal research, but nothing that I've seen. Um, but I mean, those guys' reaction times have got to be insane. They're going at, you know, 160 to 200 miles per hour. Um, you know, other cars around them, you know, anything could happen. So dehydration, again, as I said earlier, I think the biggest concern quite often is, is the safety element of it. Um, but in terms of mitigating it, um, the cool thing that we can do, and you certainly, certainly do it in, in Formula One, in boxing, in MMA, but we tend not to do it in horse racing. Um, again, we're just not there professionally yet, is getting sweat, profile, uh, sweat profiling done. So at mm-hmm. least if the guys are going to sweat, if we can see what, the, what what is the composition of sweat and what is the rate of sweat, we can make up some... Um, uh, yeah, some bespoke uh, rehydration solutions for them. Um, so we know what's going out, we, we're putting straight back in. Um, and I guess just following the, the, the standard guidelines is if you're going to, if you get, you know, if you're going to uh, lose a, a litre of or a kilo of, of weight, so I'd at least put 150 to 200% back in. And, and that's very easy for like an F1 driver to do, but jockeys are super reluctant to do that because they know that the weight's then going to be a kilo heavier than what it was. Um, before they took the took the water weight off, um, so you're fighting an uphill battle there, and that's ultimately where it comes back down with jockeys at least to getting the the education and the behaviour right. Because um, if they're educated and they know, well, it's just temporary weight, it's not permanent weight, and if we get them to eat properly anyway, longitudinally over a long period of time. Um, that chubbiness I was talking about earlier, that won't be there and they should be leaner and then the need to even sweat and make weight won't be there. Um, so, yeah, we're in a bit of a cycle at the minute, but we're in, a, we're in a much better place than we were seven years ago when I first started. And there's a lot more jockeys now that identify as athletes and, and behave like athletes than, than there ever has been. Phenomenal, Dan. Well, listen, that leads into my last question, which is, and you've touched on it a little bit, but you know, what's the evolution of you know, weight making and performance and professional jockeys. And if we maybe extend this even out, if you want to comment on, on weight making sports in general. Yeah. I mean, one cool study that we've, we've literally just got ethics for is, and, and we hope it'll then put the, the, the bone, the, the bone health question to bed with the jockeys is through bone biopsies. Um, so after, obviously we're seeing jockeys, the DEXA scan saying they've got osteopenia or osteoporosis, but then you take the blood and the, the resorption markers and turnover markers are, are sort of normal, 
Um, so the, the coolest way to do it would be let's just have a look at the actual bone. So we've 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 had it passed. So in the future, so when jockeys get injured and they have to have if they have to have surgery, and the surgeon, if there's any bone fragments that need to be sort of extracted and and usually just discarded. Um, the surgeon will, will sort of pass them over and we can have a look at them through the microscope and Incredible. compare it to the, to the DEXA scan score. So if it says they've got a score of, you know, Z score of minus 2 or 2.5, sort of osteoporotic, but then you look at the bone and it's and it's really quite dense, then um, we know we can start to start questioning what the DEXA scans are saying. And these guys are, are small people, so... Um, Bit of an outlier, maybe. Absolutely. Um, so that's So that's one area. Uh, the longitudinal profiling and tracking of jockeys is something that we're hoping to to get going, um, starting with jockeys who are literally coming in um, into the industry as 16 year olds, and if we can track them right the way through to to the well, uh, hopefully till they retire, we can we can see what's going on uh, longitudinally. Um, and then yeah, I guess um, in terms of nutrition generally in, in weight making sports. I think we're onto something with the behaviour change stuff. There's, uh, there's, you know, there's been twenty, twenty years with plus of of sports science research around hydration and, and you know, the carbohydrate and protein mm-hmm. and base research, and that's all that'll always exist. And there's always a place for it. But in terms of the the sharp end, where we're dealing with athletes face to face, and it's about the application of the science. Um, quite often we know what what we need to be doing. It's it's getting it done, which is the hard part, and I think we want something, and we've got a, a good paper um, in preparation coming out um, with a bit, yeah, but their behaviour change study with the jockeys, and I think it could be easily, quite easily transferred, a across other sports, weight making and team sports, but b across disciplines. I mean, we'd be, this is in the context of nutrition in jockeys, but there's no reason it couldn't be done uh, within sports psychology or strength conditioning. Phenomenal. Listen, Dan, I appreciate you carving out some time today. Looking forward to keeping up to all your tremendous research. Where can everyone else keep in touch with you and, and on social media or, or stay connected with your research? Uh, yeah, I'm, I stay reasonably uh, active on, on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is at Nutrition Dan. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to email me, um, I guess you can get me at DM. So my initials, DM at NutritionDan.com. Phenomenal. Thanks again, Dan. Really appreciate the time tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.